is absolute value of x continuous everywhere. And you go, let's see, it looks like this. Yep, done. No, we can't do that. There's a <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> Uh, here's our proof with some, some limits, okay? What we want to prove for God, that was pretty funny, I like that. Uh, is that the, the limit exists at every point, that the limit equals the function value at every point, and that even at that weird place where it comes together, that, that exists. So here's how we're going to define it, all right? We're going to define absolute value of x in, a, in an interesting way. We're going to say that Absolute value of x, you already know this one. It's x and it's negative x. In fact, I think we could probably do that too. But this will make it even more interesting. For x is bigger than 0, for x is less than 0, let's make it 0 for x equals 0. The reason why, the reason why that this looks funny to you and why I don't have an equality here is because, do you remember what we ran into with limits as far as checking the endpoints? Do you remember what we ran into limit? There is no limit at an endpoint. You have to check the endpoints themselves, right? So we would run into this situation anyway. If I had an equal sign, that would dictate an actual endpoint. You follow me on that? So what I'm saying is that that's basically an open interval. We can check that with our knowledge of polynomials and, and continuity, no problem. Same thing with this one, that we'll have to check with one-sided limits. So here's what we know. Is this a polynomial? Yeah. Sure, it's the most simple polynomial. Well, besides a constant, that's like the most simple polynomial you can have, right? Just x. Are polynomials continuous everywhere? Yeah. Then this is continuous everywhere. It's a polynomial. What that means is continuous. Hey, is this a polynomial? Sure. That means it's continuous. Now, this is that is, well, technically a polynomial, right? That's, that's just a one, but it's one single point. This is the point zero. So when you get zero, it gives you zero. That's the where you come together on your, your absolute value. What we need to check is only this. We need to check that the one-sided limit of this one equals zero, and the one-sided limit of this one equals zero. That's what we can check. If we can prove that, then we know that that's continuous everywhere. The limit of this equals zero, the limit of this equals zero, the function is defined at zero, therefore all three pieces come together. Do you see what we're trying to do here? If you don't, then I need to know. Yes or no? Some people are just looking, yes or no? Okay. Sometimes I say I get, I get. <laughs> During the headlights. Yes, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if I have a lazy eye, and it's like, I'm looking, and you think, is he looking? <laughs> I had a teacher with a lazy eye once. This one of my production says, it'd be like this. Like, looking at you, and then you're like, yeah, yeah, I get it. And then she would switch it. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty interesting. I, she had fun with it, though. She really did. She had fun with it. Good lady. <laughs> Okay. Or man, I'm not naming names, so just had a teacher yeah. once. <laughs> Alright, so uh, <clears throat> let's go ahead and do this. We're going to check this, the limit as x approaches 0 from the right. Look at look what we're doing. x is positive, right? So from the right for x. From the left for negative x. And we'll see what each of these things are. So from the right-hand side, where does x go from the right-hand side as you approach 0? It goes to 0. It's a polynomial. You can plug it in. It's going to 0. Where does negative x go as you approach 0 from the left? Does it also go to 0? goes to zero. That checks it right there. It says that the limit, the one-sided limit exists. This limit clearly exists. It's continuous. 
Uh, this limit is exists. It says going to the point that is also defined that says the limits exist. The point exists, and they all equal each other. That means that you're continuous everywhere, and that's how you prove it. Okay, we've got to move on for a little bit. What right, right now we're going to talk about is something to do with compositions and how we can use compositions up very much to our benefit in functions. Now stick with me here. We're kind of proving stuff today if you haven't noticed. Let's say <coughs> that there's a certain function that as x approaches some number, we'll call it c, the limit definitely exists, and we'll call it l. And let's also say there's another function f, and it's continuous at l. Well, then check this out. We're going to find out right now what happens when we compose g onto f, or f of g in other words. So what happens if we take the limit as x approaches c of f of g of x? A composition. You guys have seen compositions like that before, yeah? Well. This is kind of interesting, just check, check it out for a minute. Would you agree that if the limit exists, if the limit exists, then the limit of g of x as x approaches c is equal to the limit, yes, but it's also equal to g of c, right? So then as we're <coughs> plugging in c, this is, this is g of c, but that's also equal to the limit. So this equals, so that's the same thing as f of l. Reason I, I had the extra limit in there, I, I don't need that. Uh, so, if x approaches c, then g of x approaches l. You, you with me on that one? I had the extra limit, I didn't need it. Uh, if, if g of x approaches l, and f is continuous at l, then we know if f is continuous, we can just plug that number in, this is going to be equal to f of l. Now, the cool thing is we'll make a substitution right here. And we'll say, all right, well then, we can do f of, how much is l equal to? Not just g of x. The limit of g of x. As x approaches c. What that proves to you is you can separate limits by composition. So this says, look at that. This is a composition of f of g of x. We can pull the f outside of the outside of the limit. We can take the limit of the g of x and then apply the function. That's really interesting. Yeah. F has to be continuous at L because when you compose that, you're actually not plugging C into F. You're plugging L into F. Does that make sense? You're plugging C into G. The, the limit of G as X approaches C gives you L. You're taking that L, you plug it into F. Since F is continuous at L, you can make this jump to say, if I plug in the C, that's going to go to L. If I plug in the L right here, that's going to go to F of L because it's continuous. You with me on that one? Since that happens, we can make that jump and say, oh, but wait, L is equal to the limit of G of X as X approaches C. And that proves our composition for us. Say we can separate limits by composition. So this says right here, we can separate limits by composition. Let me give you a quick example of how we can do this, how we can use it. Talk about maybe one more thing that we have for today.
So a quick example, let's say we have a limit as x approaches 4 of the absolute value 10 minus 3x squared. Here's basically what this says we can do. Do you understand how this really is a composition of one function and the absolute value function? Do you guys see that? What it says is that you can treat this, because we, don't, we haven't really defined uh, limits of absolute value. We haven't really talked about that. We've had to do one-sided limits for things like this so far. So if we haven't really talked about it, there's something that we actually can do here. This says, well, well, wait, if that's a composition, then this means, since we've proved absolute value of x, is, this is why we had to do it, why you're like, why didn't we use it here? We've already proved absolute value of x is continuous everywhere. You with me? And for this function to work, for this, con for this uh, composition to work, f had to be continuous at, every, at a point. Well, it's continuous at all points, therefore we can do the composition. Do you see the difference there? We couldn't use it here because that would be circular, but we had to prove it once. We proved it, now we can use it for absolute value. Say, oh, well, well wait, that's a composition of a function that's continuous everywhere. I can pull that outside. If you remember, uh, I hope you do. You remember? You remember? You remember? Well, I actually did that with cosine before. Remember me doing that with cosine? The reason why we could do it is because cosine is continuous everywhere. And now I've proved it for compositions. We used it earlier, but I've proved it now that we can, in fact, do that. So we say take a limit of this and then take the absolute value and that will work just fine for you. You can separate limits by composition. What's the limit of 10 minus 3x squared as we approach 4? Don't all speak at once. Negative 38? No, 38. 38. Wait. Inside. So this says you'll have the absolute value of negative 38 because the limit of 10 minus 3x squared, it, it's polynomial. You plug in the number, you get negative 38. Then we take the absolute value of negative 38, we get, and that's our answer. So the limit would be 38. A couple notes before we go. Um, if two functions are continuous everywhere, their composition will be continuous everywhere. Absolute value with any anything inside it can be considered a composition. <coughs> Two functions are continuous everywhere, their composition is continuous everywhere. Uh, it's for this reason. If this always works, if this always continues, and that's always continuous, and you can close them any, any way you want, it's still going to be continuous. One last thing about inverses. We haven't spoken about them yet. We will just briefly. If f is continuous on its domain, then f inverse will be continuous on its domain. But remember that with inverses, the domain of an inverse is the range of your original function. So. If f is continuous 